us as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, take them and turn to Genesis chapter 18. Before I get into the text, let me set the scene before you. Abraham, and it is Abraham now, his name has been changed. Uh, it happened in chapter 17 and uh, is dwelling with Sarah, no longer Sarah, but Sarah. They're dwelling, and we're going to find out, in a place called the Oaks of Memory. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't specify a species of oaks like a pin oak or a white oak or a red oak. It's just a place where a fella named Memory, who was a brother of another guy named Escol, lived, and it's in the town of Hebron. Now, if you located it on a map, if you would look and find where the Dead Sea is, you would go to the west coast of the Dead Sea and then go out uh, into uh, the countryside. And obviously, it was a grove of trees, and that is where Abraham has been sojourning now uh, for many years. Uh, Abraham lives in a tent. His uh, fellows live in a tent. They are, uh, they're, they are temporary because they are pilgrims. And yet God has given to Abraham a great promise, the promise of a seed, uh, a son, and then that there would be more descendants of Abraham than the stars are in the heaven. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a dry, desolate place. So Abraham, day after day, his existence is this. He wakes up in the morning, back, back, back. He goes to bed at night, back, back, year after year after year. No son. Abraham is now approaching 100 years of age. His wife, Sarah, is 80 years of age. And we saw last week that God reaffirms his promise to Abraham. And when we come to chapter 18, we're going to see a, 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 a I've called it a tremendous story. I think it's a great story. We're going to look at the first 15 verses this morning. But in chapter 18, it's interesting, the first 15 verses take place in broad daylight at noon. But the last of chapter 18 takes place at night. In the first part of chapter 18, God reaffirms promises, and there is joy. In the last part of chapter 18, there is a pronouncement of doom upon Sodom. And we'll get to that next week. But for this week, the scene opens up by, by Gary Larson, who is a cartoonist, uh, has a, uh, a cartoon strip. And it used to be extremely popular, but it's called The Far Side. And uh, in one of his strips, uh, two minuscule spiders are seen sitting on a sidebar at the bottom of a sliding board on a children's playground. Uh, they've just woven a giant web across the bottom of the slide. And one spider says to the other, if we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. <laughs> well, it's an utter impossibility. We know that. But a lot of times we come to the scripture and we hear the promises of God and we have that same spirit of incredulity to us. For instance, was a Messiah really born to a virgin? It's impossible. Will God really take care of every one of my sins through the blood of Christ? Impossible. Is it really possible that the salvation won for us by Christ can never be lost or undone? Impossible. Impossible. Is it really possible that Christ has secured a place for, for me in the heavens? That's impossible. 
Now, if you know nothing else after today's sermon, know this. With God, the impossible is possible. So I invite you now to draw close to the word of God this morning. Listen, learn, and believe. Now, the passage divides itself up in 15 verses into three neat parts. We see, first of all, in verses 1 through 8, an impossible association. Then we're going to see in the next section, verses 9 through 14, an impossible promise. And then we'll end up with an impossible expectation, which is verse 15. But we begin in verses 1 through 8. And let me read this. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now as we read these verses, the very first thing you see is that the Lord appears... Uh, reveals himself to Abraham in the first uh, two verses. It says Abraham is sojourning, as I said earlier. Uh, he's intense by the oak of Mamre, or the oaks of Mamre. It's in the heat of the day. And I love what it says here. It says he is sitting in the tent in the heat of the day. Now, what is he doing? He's sitting. Is resting. What is the godly thing to do in the heat of the day? Take a nap. Rest. Growing up as a child in Brazil, uh, they had a uh, they had a, a habit that each day, about two o'clock to four o'clock, you took what the Portuguese called the chesta which in Spanish is siesta. But everything shut down for a couple hours while people took a nap. Now, they then got up and went to about 7 o'clock in the evening before they shut their businesses down. But that's a, that's a good thing. KK had a great uncle. Uh, uh, his, name was, his nickname was Big Buddy. And he lived in Wisner, uh, Louisiana, and he had a hardware store. Now, Big Buddy, every morning, would go to the hardware store in a wool suit. Now, I don't know if you've been down off of Highway 15 in Wisner, Louisiana, but it gets hot and humid. But every day, he would come home, and Miss Sue, his wife, would have fixed a lunch, uh, and then he would go into his bedroom, and he had a private air conditioner in his bedroom, he would put on his pajamas, take off the suit, put on pajamas, and he'd sleep for a couple hours. Then he'd get up, put his suit back on, go back to work. It's something you do in the heat of the day, and, and that's Abraham. There's nothing special going on. He's sitting in the tent in the heat of the day, and then all of a sudden there are three people standing right in front of him. Now, that word behold is used in scripture to convey th this is something extremely out of the ordinary. I mean, when I think of desert and heat, uh, my mind goes to Lawrence of Arabia, the movie, and I can see this guy on a camel from a long distance making his way toward Lawrence and he gets larger and larger and larger. No, that's not what happens. All of a sudden, three men are standing in front of him. Now, in Hebrews, there's a verse that I believe harkens back to this event. Hebrews 13, 2, it says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, 
for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So the Lord reveals himself. And by the way, the word there in the first verse is Yahweh. It is the Lord. It's his, it's his name. Well, he lifts up his eyes, he sees them, and then he responds. And look at the, look at the action here. He, when he sees him, he doesn't get up. He doesn't just kind of say, hey, how y'all doing? You know, he doesn't do the thing we do when we drive down the road uh, and you kind of pass somebody. What do you do? You know, the finger on top of the steering wheel. Hey, no, he runs. He runs to re greet these guys. He does it with reverence. He, he, he sees a, a theophany because look, it says that he bows himself to the earth and he says, Oh, Lord. Now, in the Hebrew language, there are uh, two ways that you can spell the word that we say in English, Lord. One is Adonai, and one is Adonai. The word that is used here is reserved for God himself. He knows who it is. He saw him in chapter 17. Now, some time has gone by and, uh, since then. But he knows and he, he recognizes that it's the Lord. So it's the Lord and two angels. Now, if you read the old Christian literature, and by old I mean centuries ago, there are some who said that what this is is, a, is a, a God, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But that's kind of fanciful. I don't think it, it's credible interpretation. It is the Lord. Now, remember last week we talked about, has anyone ever seen God the Father at any time and lived? No. So who is the Lord? It's Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ appearing to Abraham. And Abraham recognizes him. And so he sees and, and, and he, he, he runs. And then he bows down. He said and bowed himself to the earth. And then he gives a request. He says, Oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. What a blessing to be in the presence of the Lord. Abraham knew it, and he did not want that to stop. He says, Stay, Lord. Stay. And then he requests that not only does he stay, but that he enjoys some fellowship. Verses 4 and 5. He says, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. Now, I want you to see something. He offers water bread and rest now those are three good things on a hot day a, a cool glass of water is very refreshing bread is always good bread is wonderful I, I, I'm not sure there's anything better on earth than good bread hot butter or cold butter on hot bread however you want to say that it's just good but then he offers to wash his feet. Now, we don't know what that's about. I mean, feet are pretty private for us. You know, I've had, you women, y'all go to these places that they do all kind of things to your feet. I, I don't really want anybody touching my feet. My, my feet are my feet. And we'll just leave it there. But. In those days, it was a sign of hospitality to wash feet. Why? They wore sandals everywhere, and their feet would get dusty. And when your feet are hot and tired, washing of the feet can be very, very refreshing. And so he's demonstrating just tremendous hospitality, but I do want to just let you know he is under-promising, and he's going to over-deliver very, very quickly. A man named Arnold Glassow, 
I have no idea who he is. But he made this quote, and I liked the quote. Some folks make you feel at home. Others make you wish you were. Let that sink in again. Some folks make you feel at home. Others make you wish you were. Well, Abraham was one of these guys that showed tremendous hospitality. Now, evidently, uh, from what is written, the culture of the Bedouins uh, practice hospitality, and it's a, a great sign of hospitality. But also, when you shared a meal with someone, it was a statement of we are at peace with each other. Things are on good terms between us. And Abraham is initiating that. Now, he knows it's the Lord. What has the Lord promised? A son. What has not happened yet? Conception. So he still doesn't have the promise, but he's initiating, sit down, have a meal. We are at peace. The covenant is still there. It's still valid. He's demonstrated great faith. And they agreed to his offer. And then in verses 6 to 8, we see in this, in, in this uh, stanza, as it were, that the Lord remains with Abraham. In verses 6 to 8, the first thing he does, he's, he allows Abraham uh, to serve. Now, I want you to note something. Note the urgency. He runs from the tent to Sarah. And then from Sarah, he r runs to the young man. Uh, this 100-year-old guy is on the move. He is spry. Now, I'm 37 years younger than Abraham was. And when I've been sitting for a long time, I don't get up and run anywhere. The first challenge is to get up. The second challenge is to make sure that I can remain stable. Then we proceed to walk, but not Abraham. He's got an urgency. So I want you to note that. But also, also don't overlook the lavishness. Remember, what did Abraham promise or offer? Water, bread, and rest. But look at what he delivers. Let's, let's read it again. He runs in to Sarah and he says, Quick, three seahs of fine flour. Now, a seah, if you look at your notes, about seven quarts. He's saying, it's a, 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 I googled it, and I googled the computation. It's 5.25 uh, uh, gallons is what he's asking her to, to prepare. Take five gallons of flour and knead it and make cakes. Now that's a lot. I, I've kneaded dough. Uh, that, that's not an easy thing. And, and they didn't have a Cuisinart back then. So it, it's hand uh, doing. I remember when uh, we were KK and I were first married, somebody gave uh, KK a starter of sourdough bread. Uh, now, the good thing about it is it tasted good. The bad thing was uh, you had to do it every week. I mean, you had to work that thing. And I can remember seeing her, but also participating in that kneading process. It's work. I can't imagine five gallons. Uh, but it happened. Now, I'm sure she had servant girls that, she was, that got involved in the process. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he says, not just a little bread, a lot of bread. And not just the standard flour, fine flour, the good stuff. And Abraham then runs to the herd, and he takes a calf, tender and good. I don't know when the last time you went to an Italian restaurant and you ordered really good veal, uh, but that's what was going on. See, he only promised bread, but he's going to deliver Veal. Now, I don't know about the Parmesan, maybe, maybe not, but nevertheless, veal. But you see that little phrase, tender, and what's the next word? Good. I think there's a hint for something else here. Let me read to you from the book, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. In Malachi, the people are back in the land. Malachi is, is uh, prophesying to them negatively. Let me read it. He says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. 
If I then am a father, where is my honor? It's like God speaking to the people. And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. So the priests were off, were somehow despising God in the leading of worship. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? You see, when the Israelites were to bring a sacrifice, it could, they, they couldn't bring an animal that was not good, that was not perfect, that was whole. They, uh, you couldn't get by with just uh, a, something. You had to bring something good and whole. Who is standing before Abraham and he's talking to? The Lord. So Abraham goes and he gets an, he gets an animal that is good. But I think also maybe we're seeing a little foreshadowing because the Lord himself will be the perfect sacrifice without blemish one day. But Abraham is offering sacrifices. He, now this is before Moses and the Levitical, Levitical priest and the sacrificial system, but he understands. He, he somehow has the know, and he brings this before the Lord. Well, lavish. And then look at what else it says. He takes curds and milk. Now, we don't know what that, that phrase really refers to because we get our milk uh, from Borden's, and it comes in a carton. Uh, I like, but I can remember... I remember my father-in-law talking about how when the milk would be delivered to their house, it was in bottles and it had a little stopper on top. And he would take that and he would take a spoon and he would dip it and he would eat what the Bible calls the curds. It's the froth that is at the top. It's the rich, fatty part of the milk. So he doesn't just give them water. He brings milk with the froth, the good on the top of it. It is, it is a lavish, extravagant kind of offering. And the Lord allows Abraham to do this. And they enjoy fellowship together. The last part of verse 8, it says, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now that's important too, because it wasn't the common way to have a meal together. If you have a meal together, you sit down, you sit across the table, or however you see it done, but not Abraham. He stands. What's he doing? Making sure they get completely served and satisfied before he, he himself eats. Tremendous show of respect, tremendous symbol of, of, of peace. He recognized that God was about to bless him. Now, what are some other tables that the Lord fellowships with us at. How about the communion table? How about the Lamb's high feast, Revelation 19, 6 through 9? Those are other times, but it's a time of peace. When we participate in communion, God is at peace with us, and we are at peace with him. It's a symbol of joy. Well, Abraham is doing that, and the Lord allows it. But I said that it was, an it was an impossible kind of event. And why do I say that? God doesn't show up every day. You don't have that kind of meal with the Lord. In fact, if you look in the Old Testament, you see other times where people offered food to the Lord, and what happened is fire comes down and devours the meal. The Lord doesn't eat with them. Abraham enjoys a meal with the Lord. They are indeed at peace. What was impossible is possible with God. Now we find in verses 9 through 11 an impossible promise 
It's a promise of personal fruitfulness. And God reveals what is impossible. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. So God reveals what's impossible. He asks the question, Where is Sarah? Abraham gives an honest answer. She's in the tent. And the Lord's kind of behind him. And then they say, Sarah will have a son this time, about this time next year. Literally, Literally, the word reads in Hebrew, at this time and life. That's what he's promised. Well, that's God's revelation. But how does Sarah respond to that? Sarah says, impossible. Now, she thought she was hidden, but the Lord knew she was there, and Sarah was old, and she laughs. It was way beyond the time to bear children. In fact, she says, I'm worn out. Several weeks ago, or about a month ago, there went this rage, this app on your phone that would go through and take your pictures and portray what you were going to look like 30, 40 years ahead. Uh, Well, she was already there. 80 years old. It wasn't time for children. And I think she does something very human. She laughs to herself. She doesn't laugh and scorn. She just laughs to herself. This ain't going to happen. It doesn't work this way. And God then replies to her. And by the way, the word that is that we, we read in the ESV that says, uh, shall I again have pleasure? That word pleasure can also be translated conception. And I think in keeping with the passage here, that's a better translation. Uh, shall I conceive a child? God replies in verses 13 and 14 and says, it is possible. He asks, why does Sarah laugh? And then he makes that statement, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, at this point in the passage, we as humans can start coming up with all kind of fanciful things. Well, if I just imagine something, then God can bring it about. I'll write a book. I love the word impossible you got to keep it in Scripture. If you go out and sell real estate, Jack Pierce found this out. The most important thing, location, location, location. Well, in Scripture, it's context, context, context. You have to keep what is the, the impossibility attached to promises that God has made in the Scripture. Things like, Will a virgin really be born? Will a child really be born of a virgin and that child be the Messiah? It's impossible by human standards, but it's possible with God. So keep it right there. The God had made this promise. And he says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Let's drive it real home this morning. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. Look around. Lots of empty places. Does that mean he's not going to keep his word? Absolutely not. Remember, Sarah's 80. Abraham's 100. With God, what is impossible is possible. In Psalm 190, uh, 139, Psalms 139, verse 6 says, Such knowledge is too wonderful me. For me, it is high. I cannot attain it. 
Well, the third impossibility is the, is the expectation of faith. Indeed, verse 15. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. Who is speaking to Sarah? God. Who does Sarah tell a whopper to? God. She lies to God. And why? Because she's scared. She is scared, and it just blurts out. You know, I find great comfort right here because I also know what the book of Hebrews says. In chapter 11, it says that God gave Sarah the ability to believe him. You see, faith just doesn't well up within us. We, we don't just naturally come by it, especially when it flies in the face of promise of God and what our eyes see and experience. But God gives us, through his spirit, the ability to believe and the ability to have faith, and he did it for her. But she's exposed. She was not hidden from God. She's afraid, so she lies. And God reveals the truth, and he says, no, but you did laugh. And there's no answer after that. Automobile genius Henry Ford once came up with a revolutionary plan for a new kind of engine which we know today as the V8. Ford was eager to get his great new idea into production. He had some men draw up plans and he presented them to the engineers. As the engineers studied the drawings one by one, they came to the same conclusion. He'd have to be told gently his dream was impossible. Ford said, produce it anyway. They replied, but it's impossible, go ahead. Ford commanded, and stay on the job until you succeed, no matter how much time is required. For six months, they struggled with drawing after drawing, design after design, nothing. Another six months, nothing. At the end of the year, Ford checked with his engineers, and they once again told him that what he wanted was impossible. Ford told them to keep going, and they did. And they discovered how to build a V8 engine. Now, that's on a human level. And we've seen examples of that kind of thing. But when things are absolutely impossible, by, by all natural laws, not just something supposed, when it really is impossible, if God has promised it, it is possible. Because God will bring to pass what he has promised. He keeps his promise. So is it really possible that Christ was born to a virgin? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it really possible that God has taken care of every one of our sins by the blood of Christ? Absolutely. Is it really possible that the salvation Christ has won for us can never be lost or undone? Absolutely. Is it really possible that Jesus has secured for us a place in heaven where we will live with him for eternity? Absolutely. Because with God, the impossible is possible. Believe. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for